Hi there and welcome. Today we are taking a look at something out of the ordinary. This is a Sinclair Radionics System 2000 Hi-Fi set. And as far as I know, that was the first uh, consumer product that Sinclair made. Mm. Sinclair. I saved up for one of his uh, Hi-Fi kits when I was a kid. Mm. Looked nice. Matte Black System 2000. System 3000. System 2000 was in silver 20 watts as opposed to 40 watts in the System 3000. It consists of an amplifier below here and uh, there's a tuner on top. And as far as I know, it also came with two small loudspeakers, but uh, unfortunately I don't have any of these. The boxes themselves are made of brushed aluminium and the buttons are made of uh, plastic. I don't have much experience with the quality of products made in the late uh, 60s, but uh, they look all right considering they were made in a small shop, uh, probably by Sinclair and his people uh, directly. So it, it, they're not coming from a factory as such. If we take a look at the amplifier, um, we have a few buttons missing, but uh, the thing is still working. Uh, everything works fine, I guess. Um, I haven't switched it on yet. Just picked it up from the post office a couple of uh, minutes ago. Uh, but basically there are some uh, radio buttons and some potentiometers. It is possible to uh, select between aux in, uh, pick up one, and uh, then you can select mono and stereo. There's a tape input, and uh, that can be switched on and off independently of the pickup and the aux in. So that's a little bit weird that the tape button is not part of the uh, part of the radio button there. Then there's a button called filter. I am not quite sure what that does. Then the power switch is here, which is a little bit unusual. I think in the modern day equipment, the power switch would be on the left here. Uh, but anyway, no problem. Then there's a bass control, uh, a treble control, the volume control, and then out here on the right there's a balance uh, control. And that's basically all the controls there are on the front panel. Um, on top here, I'm not sure you can see it on the video, there in the corner it says uh, Sinclair System 2000. And uh, that's basically just dropped on with some Letra set uh, or something like that. Uh, it's, it's not printed directly, I think. I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sticker kind of thing. Okay, if we look at the back here, it says Made in England by Sinclair Radionics Limited, Cambridge. Uh, this one is a Mark II. And it says serial number down here and something has been scratched in with a pointy metal thing. Uh, it's all done by hand. And uh, from what I could read online, this thing was made uh, totally by hand in a small shop. Then there's a voltage input selector, 110 volts or 220. Then there's a mains output. But uh, basically if you connected the tuner through here and then you had only one uh, wire going to the, to the mains and you could switch everything on from the main switch in the front here. Then there's a power input and the cable is really, really thin. If you look at it here, it is really thin wire. I'm, I've never, it looks like something for a pair of loudspeakers or something. Um, I'm not sure this would be legal today. Then on the right here we have um, speaker output and uh, inputs here. Interesting enough there's a pick up 1 and pick up 2. But there's no pick up 1 and pick up 2 button on the front. So how that is supposed to work I'm not quite sure. Uh, also I'm not sure you can see it but there's a gap here. Uh, where you can poke a finger in directly into the electronic. So uh, yeah, it's not that professional, I should say. There we go. And yeah, we can see there's a little... Uh, there's a little metal bracket here, just to prevent people from sticking their fingers into the electronics. So uh, not too bad. And actually, this is surprisingly good. This is uh, very similar to what an amplifier would look today. If I take my uh, Yamaha equipment from uh, the living room, it would be basically like this. Single-sided PCB, some selectors here, and uh, yeah, this is before the op amp, I guess. So there's a lot of discrete uh, transistors on this board here. And uh, these are 
I heard some reject transistors that he found from some supplier. So they must have been measuring them out one by one in a transistor tester and picked those that were usable and then uh, dumping the rest. But uh, yeah, pretty good. Uh, power is coming in, goes through a fuse, goes through the transformer. Uh, the secondary goes down here, there's a couple of diodes and a big capacitor. And then it's just all analog all the way, all transistor based. So these little black things that look like capacitors, they are actually the transistors themselves. And the package is not even a TO92. The cheap cheap transistors are ME4101, which are from a company called Microelectronics in Hong Kong. And of course back then there was no China to do all the low cost manufacturing, so Hong Kong was the hub for cheap electronics. And uh, yeah, I guess a Hong Kong company doing uh, transistors, the quality control may not have been too good. The power transistors are BD155 and uh, they are from uh, Motorola. So I guess that's where he bought the outer spec transistors that, uh, he, uh, that he used for his products. And okay, something really cool here. I flipped it over and uh, you can see the quality control sticker. And it says BB that was written properly. And then you can see in red, Clive. And uh, that should be Clive Sinclair, I guess. So uh, I got his signature. Unfortunately, you can see the BB was written while the PCB was laying flat on something. And the Clive was probably written like this with the PCB already in the enclosure. So the PCB assembly QA would be done by someone called BB. And then the final assembly would be checked by Clive himself. So Sinclair Electronics back then must have been a really small operation. But uh, I just thought you would like to see it. I got Clive's signature. So woohoo! So uh, yeah, I like it. Uh, I'm not sure whether it works or not. Uh, but uh, let's try and power it on. And uh, yeah, everything is good. So let's probe around a little bit with my oscilloscope. And there's a massive sine wave on top of the rectifier diode so that can't be good Ooh, whatever it's called never bloody worked <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna leave the repair of this machine for another day um, it's not gonna be today but uh, yeah it's definitely repairable it's just basic uh, transistor uh, electronics if we take a look at the tuner there's a tuning knob here and there's a scale and uh, it's a little bit tight, I'm not sure whether it's still working, uh, but otherwise there's a piece of acrylic here with some uh, things still screened on, on top of it. Then on the right side here there are four buttons, one, two, three, four. And I thought they would be something like uh, preset uh, channels. But uh, I don't know how you, how you would set the channel using these four, so that would be interesting uh, if we manage to power it up and see how that is supposed to work. On the back there's a 220 volts input or 110 volt input and again the cable is very very flimsy. It's a 220 volt selector and uh, then we have remote and output. And I'm not quite sure what remote is. I think I found the schematic for this thing online so um, I might be able to uh, shed some light on that later. Uh, but anyway there are two antenna inputs. There's a standard uh, 50 ohm, uh, sorry there's a standard 75 ohm uh, connector here and then there's one of these old types for 240 ohm and again we have the text on the back here uh, this one is in a little bit better condition than the amplifier and the serial number again is scratched in by hand now if we look at the tuner there's basically a power transformer over here with a rectifier and uh, that's it for the power supply I don't see it's being regulated anywhere, but that is uh, possible that these two things here are transistors. Uh, if they are transistors, I don't see any diodes. So um, that's a little bit strange, but maybe underneath the PCB there's something soldered on. Uh, then we have the radio itself. The antenna comes in through here. And uh, there's a couple of transistors for the RF front end. And uh, a little uh, can here for filtering. And uh, then it goes through a transistor amplifier to this chip here, which is an uh, SN76660 and, uh, that is an, uh, and that is an FMD modulator. The signal then goes from there to this chip here, which is another Texas chip, an SN76110. 
and that is the stereo demodulator. So uh, basically, it's a two-chip solution. And uh, back then, of course, we needed a lot of coils and stuff like that, so that is included here as well. Now the tuning is being done using a Varacta diode, and uh, I haven't been able to find it, although I think it's that thing uh, here. Now the Varacta diode, of course, needs a variable voltage across it. Uh, because when you change the voltage across it, it will change the capacitance. And uh, if you use that in an oscillator, uh, then of course you can change frequency based on the voltage across it. And uh, if we look at the mechanical design here, the scale is of course here and it's being driven by a belt uh, from a knob that is uh, that, that the user is uh, turning here. And uh, it's geared, you can see one rotation here, it's maybe one-fifth of a rotation. Uh, of uh, the wire here uh, and also very interesting the way that they change the voltage across the varactor diode is with a potentiometer uh, that is sitting down here that, that that round thing here that is a potentiometer and that is connected directly through the axle on the gear down um, adjustment uh, knob here so very simple mechanically uh, and I think uh, Sinclair must have bought this plastic thing here uh, with the scale from Hong Kong, I don't think it's something that he he did himself. Uh, simply, the plastic tooling would be too expensive. Uh, otherwise, it looks pretty standard. I mean, this is 1968 and uh, 69 maybe, and uh, yeah, it could have been done like 10 years, 20 years ago. It's not that old a technology. Uh, of course, now everything is sucked into a single chip. But uh, I've been doing FM radios based on the, something similar to this. Another interesting thing is that the trim uh, potentiometers, they, have, they are color coded and you can see there's been sitting some operator with a little paint brush and, uh, and they put in a dot there. So that would be a manual assembly to make a potentiometer. I mean that wouldn't work today but back then that was uh, probably acceptable. Now finally on the tuner here, if you remember the four buttons on the front, um, the one named one is connected through some wires to uh, the front end over here. Number two is wired to a stereo decoder so that could be stereo mono. Uh, number three I can't see where it goes to because it's hidden down here and the uh, number four is actually the power on. There's uh, 220 volts on these wires here. So um, yeah why wouldn't they label them power and mono and stereo and what have you. Uh, again, I guess this is a cost issue. They just bought some buttons with the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 on it and then they would let the user figure it out. So when you look at the quality of the product, it's actually not too bad. Okay, the power supply would not uh, comply to today's standard. And uh, the knobs on the front panel, if you push them in too far, they would actually rub against the aluminium enclosure itself. But uh, apart from that, I think it's quite decent for a small company that was basically part of the British electronics cottage industry. So actually I'm quite pleasantly surprised. But anyway, uh, that's it for this video. I will see you again later.